weapon. Despite the vest, he was shot in the lower back as well as an arm and a leg. Jeff retreated back into Neva Rogers' classroom and killed himself among six of his victims. Jeff's family members, like many other residents in the small community, flocked to the high school. When an aunt saw Dash Lucier's police vehicle pulled right up to the doors, they assumed he had already responded to the scene. Some time would pass before they realized that he wasn't there, only to find he and Michelle dead in their home. The community was upended. Almost every resident in Red Lake knew or was related to a victim or survivor. Five days after the massacre, then-President George W. Bush made a statement regarding the tragedy during his weekly radio address on March 26, 2005. This week, we have seen tragedy at home. Families in Minnesota are mourning the loss of their loved ones after the terrible shootings at Red Lake High School. Hours after the shooting, communities and churches across the nation offered prayers for the victims and their families. The Red Lake Nation reports receiving thousands of calls from people all over the world offering their sympathy and support. Laura and I are praying for the families of the victims, as are millions of Americans. This week, I spoke with Red Lake Tribal Chairman Floyd Jourdain to express the condolences of the American people and to pledge the continued help of the federal government. We are doing everything we can to meet the needs of the community at this tragic time. The FBI and the Department of Justice are working to coordinate relief through the Federal Crime Victim Assistance Fund. We're working closely with state, local, and tribal authorities to provide counseling, help with funeral arrangements, and other assistance. The tragedy at Red Lake was accompanied by acts of heroism and selflessness. Security guard named Derek Brunn saved the lives of countless students when he rose from his desk to confront the young gunman. Although he was unarmed, Derek ignored the pleas of a colleague to run for his life. By engaging the assailant, he bought vital time for a fellow security guard to rush a group of students to safety. Derek's bravery cost him his life, and all Americans honor him. As we help the families in this community, we must do everything in our power to prevent tragedies like this from happening. Children benefit from a sense of community and the support and involvement of caring adults. To keep our children safe and protected, we must continue to foster a culture that affirms life and provides love and helps our young people build character. The Red Lake Tribal Council distributed checks in the amount of $5,000 to 15 families impacted by the Red Lake shootings in the form of Victims' Aid grants. This included the family of shooter Jeff Weiss, which only further divided the community. The Tribal Council simply stated that his family endured a double burden in this tragedy. The funds were meant to ensure proper funerals were possible for the victims, including Jeff Weiss, who had a traditional burial ceremony. Multiple lawsuits were filed and settled in relation to the massacre by staff members with PTSD and by victims' families. 21 plaintiffs representing victims sued McNeil Environmental over their failure to implement crisis plans at the school, as they had been hired to do. The plaintiffs settled that case for $1.5 million in 2008 and were previously awarded $1 million in their case against the school district in 2006. In 2009, Teacher Missy Dodds won a historic settlement in her quest to have workers' compensation payments cover mental trauma causing mental injury, making it as compensable as a physical injury. In total, 10 teachers and staff filed the same suit, and their victory ultimately led to PTSD coverage included under workers' compensation in Minnesota after 2013 and in more and more states since then. Following the shooting, Jeff May returned to continue his healing as a hero. He was ultimately awarded $750,000, but it did little to fill the void of the life he'd wanted but had ripped away from him. With the death of his love Alicia and his best friend Dwayne, he lost his support. With his injury and recovery, he lost his assumed future of a football career. Dreams of a happy life and marriage were buried along with the victims. After ten years, he had yet to fall in love again. 
The four identified students who survived being shot by Jeff Weiss that day are Stephen Cobinet, who lost his left eye and suffered brain damage from a shot to his head, Cody Thunder and Lance Crow, both 15, and 15-year-old Ryan Oganash, who was critically wounded by a blast to the chest. When they'd heard loud, unidentifiable noises, Ryan was voted to be the one to investigate. He left and quickly returned to his classmates shot in the chest. All survived and recovered from their injuries and joined hundreds of other survivors who continued to grapple with memories of that day. With every new shooting spree this country endures, survivors of the previous ones feel the pain each time anew. The only arrest made in connection to this case was 16-year-old Louis Jourdain, a distant cousin of Jeff Weiss, and the son of the chairman of the Red Lake Band of Chippewa. At the time of the shootings, Chairman Floyd Jourdain stated, quote, Our community is devastated by this event. We've never seen anything like this in the history of our tribe, and without doubt, this is one of the darkest days in the history of our people. On March 29, 2005, following his son's arrest, the Minneapolis Star Tribune printed a statement from Chairman Jourdain that read, Last week I spoke on behalf of the Red Lake Nation as its leader and a saddened member of this community. Today I speak as a father. As many of you are aware, my son Lewis has been charged in association with the shootings that occurred here last week. My heart is heavy as a result of the tragic events that unfolded here in our nation, but it is with optimism that I state my son Lewis's innocence. He is a good boy with a good heart who never harmed anyone in his entire life. I know my son and he is incapable of committing such an act. It was determined after the final investigation concluded that as many as 39 teens online and throughout the community had been casually approached by Jeff to participate in a shooting spree. Following a search of his home, investigators had found a detailed map of Red Lake High School with notes and instructions pertaining to an impending attack. Jeff Weiss's original intent had been to position accomplices at exits and converge on a packed gymnasium, such as on the first day of school or prom night. As the crowd fled, shooters at the doors would unleash a surprise attack. It was even reported that Jeff and Lewis both belonged to a small group of goths at school who called themselves the Darkers. More than 900 emails, texts, and chats were evaluated by investigators, containing school shooting conversations which spanned more than two years. But still, none of these participants thought he was serious. Several students in the library when the rampage began reported seeing Louis Jourdain react to the sounds of gunfire. They heard him immediately yell out Jeff Weiss's name and run from the library toward the shots, not away from them. The only person ultimately prosecuted in this case was Louis Jourdain, as apparently his conversations were more involved and incriminating than anyone else's. He was charged and sentenced as a juvenile in January 2006 after pleading guilty to sending threatening messages over the internet. He had initially been arrested on a federal charge of conspiracy to commit murder. Some in the community felt this prosecution was an attempt to place blame on anyone they could since the perpetrator had taken his own life. Unfortunately for us diligent fact stalkers, his case is sealed. However, it's evident he was sentenced to no more than one year in a juvenile treatment facility. Just months before the Red Lake shootings, the FDA had ordered that makers of antidepressants such as Prozac begin printing black box warnings on their packaging. The intent was to inform potential users of a possibility of increased suicidality when prescribed to adolescents. The warnings were designed to limit casual use of the drug and stress that they were meant for use under strict supervision of a physician. Please know that if you or someone you know has thoughts of self-harm, suicide hotlines exist to try and help. 
In the U.S., call 1-800-273-8255. And outside the U.S., please seek out your nation's crisis intervention phone number and resources. There are people you can talk to. Another undervalued resource is 866-SPEAK-UP. Please let the young people in your life know that they can anonymously speak to a trained professional about weapons threats at their school or in their communities. As we have seen time and time again, other kids often know before the violence takes place. 866 Speak Up is the first and only national hotline for anonymous tips about threats to our schools. Please help spread the word. I can't imagine the guilt some kids must face because they didn't know how to speak up. As always, thanks for joining me to revisit what was, in 2005, the worst school shooting since Columbine. It stayed in that dreaded number one position until the Sandy Hook Massacre on December 14, 2012. The Red Lake shooting remains the worst mass shooting in Minnesota history. See you back here soon for a tale of holiday murder, and then we'll finish off our look at campus-based crime. Each case is unique, and with luck, we can learn from the past. But until then, lovelies, don't be scared.